Hi, I'd like to share with you a film review on a movie from perhaps the longest running film series ever based on Ian Fleming's James Bond 007. Like this one, every review I do afterwards has got to be hand-picked, so join me now for the 007 body count. I'd like to start that body count, or rather movie count, with Honor Majesty's Secret Service. Forget about my favorite Bond movie, this has to be one of my favorite movies, period. Opening in 1969, this film had the distinction of being the first of the series to be featured in full stereo in theaters. It starred George Lazenby, who took up the role from Sean Connery and was the only one of six actors within the series to appear as Bond in just one movie. That's aside from David Niven and Barry Nelson. This was also the only film to be directed by Peter Hunt, whose distinctive editing style known from the previous five Bond films assure the confidence of Eon Productions in him to carry the torch. This is where they broke the mold of the previous films, having a more intricate story revealing the complexities you find in the character whenever you read the books. Screenwriter Richard Maybaum gave the ultimate opening line for the main character during the film's intro, quote, This never happened to the other fellow. That allowed audiences, I believe, to accept a new actor as Bond, and to connect with a movie that had a more futuristic tone, so one could arguably say that that never happened to the film series. Now, this is the first film in the series where everything that you see that happened on screen really takes place in the book. The novel is the second of what many know as the Blofeld trilogy, preceded by Thunderball and concluded with You Only Live Twice. I find it fascinating that because this book was published at the height of popularity of Connery through the earlier films, the author in this story draws the main character's lineage from Scotland. You'll find that in the novels, Fleming draws from real-life people and experiences that he then includes subsequently in the books. For instance, the whole climax with Bond escaping down the slopes of Piz Gloria from Blofeld's henchmen was taken from an actual account experienced by Fleming himself caught at the end of an avalanche while skiing down a slope in Austria. Another interesting tidbit of trivia is that the resort at the top of Piz Gloria in Switzerland completed construction on the tab of the filmmakers, provided that the owner granted them permission to shoot there. As pre-mentioned, Blofeld is in only three of the books of the whole series, but in those books you learn everything about him. His background, where he came from, how he found Inspector, I mean the whole man Chinese, so to speak. However, in the films, over the years, the character has become somewhat cliched to the point of even being spoofed on. Be that as it may, in the movies he appears in seven films, and all the way through, you know nothing about his background, leaving more to speculation, making his character more menacing and unpredictable. And from Russia with Love and Thunderball, you don't see his face at all, just from behind, his hands holding the cat, or his finger pushing the button to have someone whacked. During this period, he was voiced by Austrian character actor Eric Pullman and played physically by Anthony Dawson, who most remember as Professor Den from Dr. No, or as some Hitchcock fans may recall from Dial M for Murder. It's almost reminiscent of Don Corleone from The Godfather. It wouldn't be surprising if Francis Ford Coppola was influenced by this character while making that picture. Audiences first saw Blofeld face to face in You Only Live Twice, played by Donald Pleasance, who many remember from the famous war prison movie The Great Escape, and a more newer generation of film goers actually got to know as the character of Dr. Loomis from John Carpenter's Halloween. In Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Telly Savalas assumed the role with a more stronger physical presence, as was seen during the bobsled fight and chase sequence towards the film's climax at the end. Like Pleasance, he had a distinctive voice, but also a physical durability that added a new dimension to the character. Based on his appearance in The Dirty Dozen, it was agreed that Savalas had a certain toughness and rugged stature that made him more than a match for 007 in this film. On the other hand, while rehearsing a knife fight for one scene, Lazenby literally broke the nose of the acting stunt coordinator on the set, who also by chance happened to be a pro wrestler. Unlike the action sequences in the previous films, which were more cinematic, the fight scenes in particular for this one had a strong, 
comic book texture making a much more fast pace. Also, John Barry's score, which is arguably the best of the series, employed the use of synthesizers to accompany orchestration, giving the film a much more modern feel, way ahead of its time, along with echoing type sound effects added during action scenes. This was actually one of the few films that employ heavy use of gadgets. You don't see any gadgets at all, and yet it's captivating, fun to watch, and unforgettable. Perhaps what made this film most memorable was the female lead who was similar to Anna Blackman, and perhaps even an influence on actresses in more recent films like Olga Kalenko from Quantum of Solace. Diana Rigg, who was discovered because of her appearance on The Avengers, played Contessa Teresa de Vincenzo, or rather Tracy, the daughter of Mark Ons Draco, the head of the Union Corps, and the only woman in the series to marry 007, only to meet a tragic end quickly afterwards reminding audiences of the price of true love for the secret agent. One of the most unforgettable supporting roles from this film was that played by Italian actor Gabriele Frazzetti as Mark Anstraco, which could be compared to the likable character of Karim Bey, played by Pedro Armendez of From Rush of Love. Recognition for the role was earned by his appearance in the Sergio Leone classic western Once Upon a Time in the West, but many Criterion fans may recall him from the famous Michelangelo Antonioni film from Italy, La Aventura, back in 1960. In this film, he's very Godfather-esque. When asked by 007 if he knew the whereabouts of Blofeld, quote, If I knew, I wouldn't tell Her Majesty's Secret Service, but I might tell my future son-in-law. The story for this movie literally forks in two starting off with fatal encounters between Tracy and Bond, which starts to become something that weaves into a very close relationship, unheard of in a Bond movie, while leading to an investigative trail of a certain claim to the title of Count de Blochamp of royal ancestry. Towards the middle of the picture, Bond poses in a very Clark Kent fashion as Sir Hilary Bray from the London College of Arms. The trail then leads to an exclusive clinic that specifically cures allergies at the top of a mountain in the Swiss Alps, and the claim it turns out to be Ernst Stavro Blofeld. A continuity cap occurs as it's quickly forgotten that Bond and Blofeld had met before in the previous film, as in this one Blofeld doesn't know it's him, until his caretaker and henchwoman, Madame Bunt, played by the late Elsie Stapat, catches him seducing one of the patients in the clinic. As everybody knows, you can't have a Bond movie without Bond girls, right? Well, this film actually has 12 who are dubbed the 12 Angels of Death. Coming from all over the world, each suffer severe allergies and are recruited to be treated at the clinic. The undercurrent motive, however, is to release biological toxins through what look like simple complimentary vanity makeup kits given to them on Christmas Eve right before leaving. The intent at the right time is to blackmail the adjoining governments into giving full affirmation of Blofeld's title, absolution of his criminal record, and a large payoff. This was one of those films that didn't garnish the fame and recognition that it deserved until many years later. What strikes you most when first seeing the movie is how real and human the main character is. Unlike Connery's self-assured, quick-witted tough guy with GQ Edge, Lazenby is spontaneous, but at times self-conflicted and in over his head, which allows the viewer to see the character on a more personal level. It could be said that the later films, with Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan, and Daniel Craig, followed a thread which was left for a while but brought back, based on the books, with Lazenby as the ultimate reference through Honor Majesty's Secret Service. The film stands on its own within the decade it was made not topping the numbers of what the previous films made, but remaining number one at the box office while in theaters, being one of the highest grossing films of 1968. Because Lazenby announced in mid-production that he wouldn't do another Bond movie, the story was condensed into one film, giving it an unexpected quality peppered with moments that make it a unique viewing experience going on a deeper level than the Cold War and the Secret Agent. It has a sharp, distinctive edge, setting a precedent for new worlds, new ideas, 
for the bond of the 70s and beyond. Hope you enjoyed this review. I shall return with six more, making the body count a total of seven. 007 that is, with accounts and fun facts that'll leave you shaken, but not stirred. See ya.